think we're starting to have everyone join now and I hope we're all enjoying the welcome music that we were so lucky to hear there. Um, welcome everyone to the webinar tonight. Um, I hope that you're all looking forward to um, the event that we have uh, for you. Um, I want to start by um, welcoming everyone and to acknowledge that wherever we're calling in from today, we're calling in from the lands of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and for those of you joining, um, it would be really great if you'd like to um, pop where you're calling in from in the chat, um, whose country you're on. I'm calling in from the lands of the Gimoy, Wallabara, Yudinji and Yurikanji people. And I wanna extend my respects to their elders um, past and present, um, and also to all of the different um, places we're calling in from, from all of the country that we're on um, and extend my respects to that country and the people who are there. And also to extend my respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are on the call with us tonight um, and there are a number of you so um, extending my respect to you and acknowledging that um, this always was and always will be the lands of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people wherever we are um, and that sovereignty wasn't ceded uh, and that uh, you know our country is our country and culture go hand in hand um, and so, you know, that's really what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, my name's Lucy. I'm the director at the Cairns and Far North Environment Centre, and I'll be one of your MCs tonight. Um, and I'd like to throw to Jono, who will also be here. Hi, so great to be with you all tonight. I'm Jono. I'm the CEO at Environment Victoria, and I'm joining from Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung country. Back to you, Lucy. Thanks, Jono. So um, we're really excited to be hosting um, the environment movements, you know, uh, like referendum and environment webinar tonight. Um, this is a shared event hosted by a group of different conservation councils and environment organisations from across Australia. And, you know, when you joined, you would have seen some of those names of those organisations at the um, bottom. And I'm sure there's many people from many different organisations all over Australia here tonight. Um, we really want to acknowledge that as a, nat a national event, we've got people calling from the tip to the bottom of Australia, from coast to coast, from big cities to tiny towns and maybe even places that wouldn't be considered towns and acknowledge, um, you know, that Australia is a huge place with such a diversity of um, amazing country, people, experiences and contexts um, and uh, really welcome who you are in the place that you are and thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit of um, what to expect tonight and um, uh, the agenda that we have first up. So um, that'll be popped in the chat now, but the way that tonight's going to run, uh, Jono and I are going to do a little bit of context setting for everyone about how we got here, why we're here and why this moment is important. Um, we're then going to invite our guest panellists um, who uh, we're really excited to have on the call tonight to um, provide their insights to um, the moment that is the referendum on the 14th of October and also to answer um, some of the questions that have come in um, before tonight uh, and as well as then going to a shorter question and answer from questions that you can uh, put into the chat tonight as well. Um, with that shorter question and answer, we probably won't have time to answer everyone's questions, but we'll be pulling up the ones that we can answer in the time that we have there. But hopefully by answering a lot of the questions that have come in beforehand, um, we'll be able to provide a lot of clarity um, for you know the information that people are seeking um, and then we'll wrap up um, and, you know, we will be sending some follow-up information with the recording and, you know, links to more information afterwards. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, 
but it's really important also that tonight we're having a really respectful and meaningful conversation because that's what this moment is all about. Um, and so we do have some um, norms that we ask everyone to follow tonight and they're going to be popped in the uh, chat as well. It goes out without saying that we're all here to have a respectful conversation and to be respectful of everyone participating in this space. This is an opportunity really for all of um, as attendees and as even as MCs for us to listen um, and, you know, to really take in what, you know, the leaders who are on our panel um, have to say and share with us tonight. Um, and we're really asking that, you know, um, we don't have, uh, that we're really respectful in the chat. So, you know, we really want you to put your um, questions in there, seeking information and trying to understand better so that we can draw them out in the Q&A. Um, but uh, while our speakers are presenting, we're keen not to have too much chat rolling through because it can be a really big distraction from what folk are saying in the time. So, yeah, we're just saying, you know, um, if you can, reduce the banter or conversation that happens while our speakers are speaking. That's a, a way to show that you're, we're really paying attention to what they're saying. Um, and, you know, to be really explicit, if there are any um, in, in inappropriate, disrespectful or discriminatory behaviour in the chat, um, we will be removing people. So we're not going to be tolerating any um, discrimination in this space um, and we're creating a safe space for everyone um, and that's what that's about. Um, and so, you know, um, make sure that you're regulating yourself and being respectful in that chat as well. Um, as far as how question and answers will work, we have some prepared questions for the panelists from all of the questions, amazing questions that you sent in, and we've done our best to combine those and, and, and the speakers will be speaking to them. And we'll also be collecting live questions in the Q&A function um, and drawing them up in question and answer time. Um, if you have those questions, please put them in the Q&A area of the chat. Um, we have some volunteers um, tonight who will also be looking at the chat and seeing if there's anything that we can answer, you know, as we go. So they'll be um, doing their best to help out in the chat. We'll keep everyone's um, mics and videos off during um, the webinar just so that we can provide space to the people who are speaking tonight, but the chat function will be on. <laughs> It is 2023, but, you know, online webinars are still challenging. So we do have tech support tonight. Um, and if you look in the chat, those people have an asterisk in front of their name. So if you're having issues, you can message them. Like maybe you can't hear or see or you're having issues, please um, just look for the person who's got a star in front of their name. They are our um, tech support tonight. Also, we've, um, Sarah is our main tech person, so please look for her if you can't see the star. And we've also got our wonderful um, helper, Emma, who's going to be uh, working on community safety and well-being during this event. So she might message you um, if there's anything you might need or if you need something, please feel free to message her um, directly on um, the chat function. We'll also be sharing a bunch of links to web pages throughout the course of tonight. Um, don't worry if you don't capture them more because we will send them in the follow-up email. So we will provide a bunch of information live tonight and also after the event. So that is all of the boring but necessary um, housekeeping. Thank you for um, respecting those guidelines and really making tonight a really beautiful and hopeful space because that's what we want to create together. Um, and I think, you know, before we go on, we are all here because this is a really big moment in Australian history and whatever happens, it will be a big moment in Australian history. That's what referendums are known for. And one of the things that really has stuck with me is uh, one of the quotes from the aunties involved in the 1967 referendum who said, you know, if we had have known how big that moment was, we would have asked for more. And I think, you know, it's really interesting to reflect on that and making sure we're not missing um, anything in the moment that that is. And I'm really excited that everyone's chosen to join tonight because that means that um, you've chosen to make sure you're not missing anything in this moment. Um, we know that there's a lot of complexity and nuance 
that exists in the context of this referendum. Um, I myself, you know, work on the ground with um, lots of conservation groups um, that include non-Indigenous and Indigenous people. And I think this has been a confusing time for a lot of people because there are a lot of narratives that are being put into the world and a lot of information that's conflicting each other. And tonight we're really here to help, you know, um, lift the hood, I guess you could say, on the range of views that, that um, do exist, the progressive, the progressive no and what that is, the more racist no campaign that exists and the yes campaign and really acknowledging that there is a difference between those things um, that particularly for people working in, you know, regional and remote and on the ground areas this has um it has been hard to access um, information as well so hopefully we're reaching out to all our urban and rural areas um and that actually there is diversity in so many places in australia because we are such a diverse country and every place has a different story and every person has a different story um but at the at the core of what we want to talk to about at the tonight is that this isn't just a moment um, for people. This is a moment for the environment as well. And even seeing those things differently is a certain, you know, way of looking at the world. And so I think hopefully tonight we can really highlight that, you know, people and nature go hand in hand. And so this referendum and this moment also is a moment where people and the environment go hand in hand and culture, country and, you know, um, all of that together is is really it, it bleeds from every bit of the work that we do. So I think um, that was really the context I wanted to provide, um, you know, for, for how we got here today. And I think, and the moment that we're in, but I want to throw over to Jono who, you know, I've been around for 10 years doing active stuff in the environment movement. Jono has been around for even longer time and I think can talk a bit to the history. Um, so I'm going to throw over to him. Thanks, Jono. Thanks, Lucy. Um, I'm coming to grips with the fact that I am getting old. When I was in high school, um, Pauline Hanson was elected on a platform of punching down on Asians and Aborigines. And it was the same election John Howard became Prime Minister. And part of his agenda was to let energy resources of Australia dig up near our country on Kakadu. Um, the proposed Jabaluka mine was a fight that brought together environmentalists and traditional owners in an iconic battle against big money and racist politics. And ultimately they won. Why I'm telling this story is because it's one of so many stories in the history of the environment movement where we have joined forces with First Nations to protect country, where a shared threat brought us together in common cause. But whilst ERA and John Howard were the villains of the day, they represented just the latest in a long line of greedy businessmen and politicians looking to make a profit with little care for those who they harmed along the way. And it's really important for me to remember that this thirst for land and resources was actually what drove the colonisation of this place we call Australia in the first place that led to the horrific frontier wars, to the destruction of great rivers and grasslands and forests. And the horrible truth is it has never really stopped. For most of the last two decades, I've been involved in the politics of the Murray-Darling, Australia's biggest river system, the ancestral domain of over 40 nations. And in that time, global investors have discovered the Murray and its sophisticated water market. They've bought up huge volumes of water entitlements, pushing the price of water to stratospheric levels and making mega profits in the process. But in the meantime... First Nations like the Barkindji have seen devastating fish kills in the Darling Barker. We've all seen them in, our, in the news. Um, and after centuries of fighting successfully, ultimately, to get their land back, people like the Barkindji are seeing a new wave of dispossession as unchecked greed of water barons robs them of a living river. So what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is that in this country we call Australia, as it is all around the world, when we're talking about environmental destruction, we're only talking about part of the picture because for First Nations, the struggle to protect country is part of a bigger struggle for liberty and the right to self-determination. And so as environmentalists, I believe we need to support that struggle, not just when beautiful places are under threat, but every day of the year. 
it is a struggle that is absolutely connected and profound. Um, so with that, um, I want to hand over to uh, Josie Alec, a proud Gurma Martha Dunara woman and ACF's First Nations lead. ACF is the national conservation organisation uh, in this country. She's an Indigenous conservationist who's been involved in the fight to protect country all her life. And Josie, I'm really sorry, I did not ask you how to pronounce the name of your people in your country beforehand. So forgive my probable mispronunciation there, but lovely to have you on board today. Thank you. <laughs> That's fine, Johnny. Um, yeah, and thank you, uh, every, everyone, for having us uh, today uh, here on the webinar. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm currently up in Nullama country, in my country, in the Pilbara in WA, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge my old people and um, and all my ancestors and uh, the young pe people and all of my mob uh, here that, we've, that I'm on um, this meeting today. So... So speaking about culture and environment, and and I'm just want to tell you a little bit of a story. And and if anybody's heard of Save Our Songlines, that was uh, something that I co-founded with my niece Raylene Cooper, who's now in court with Woodside. Um, got an injunction the other day uh, to stop the pipeline uh, Scarborough gas coming through. And from that very point in time of when we first started this campaign, um, it actually fell in my lap. There was a phone call. I had some people on my doorstep. We had no idea that the Scarborough gas was going to was was happening in such a big scale. We had no idea that there was going to be another um, fertilizer plant on the country in such a sacred sacred country, over a million petroglyphs, telling you know one of the oldest creation stories in the world that you know connects all around the world. And this is. You know, this is our song lines. These are everywhere we go and they're, they're in everybody's country. And, um, you know, we have to really honour and respect that. And at the moment we're seeing a really um, huge destruction and devastation of our country. And it's like, you know, we, we look out our doors, you know, we go out and we, you know, out of our cities and you look out your door and, and you see smoke coming out in this beautiful wilderness and, there's a mine and you know this is happening constantly all around our country and um as first nations people we've been here to protect that country for so long and those those stories in the rocks they are there to, to give us and uh to teach us about longevity and sustainability of all life on earth which means everything that's the environment that's everything that we are here to look after, that we're here to protect our water mainly. We are made half, you know, most of us is water as people, and we all know that. And as Jono said, water is our water sources are being attacked by these big mining companies. And that's something that we all have in common as, as people, but also as First Nations people, we have had this belief and this ingrained in our DNA for millennia since the since the dawn of time to protect and love Mother Earth and and nature and everything on her and to sustain our lives as well as everything else. And so when it comes to culture and environment, the you know, the 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 absolute um, you know, longevity of sustaining and now teaching the healing of Mother Earth has to has to be here. And so that's why when we see a destruction and we start campaigns like Save Our Songlines um, and in our countries to look after our 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 nyura, our country, is because it's not because we're told to, it's because it's ingrained in us to do so, because it's from our teachings. And what uh, you know, I suppose outsiders don't understand and now they're, you know, a, a lot of outsiders are now, you know, through environmental groups are coming together to to actually, you know, bring together the First Nations at the forefront and, and in, in you know, entwine First Nations into the environmental movement because this is what it's all about. It's about healing our country now. It's had enough and we can see those effects through climate change. We can see those effects you know, the, the impacts are happening and, 
you know, at the expense of our children. And that's a big statement, but it's so true because our children are the ones that are suffering, not only my children, but everybody's children. And so when we are here and we're standing up for them, we have to stand strong now and we've really got to make these moves. Whichever way we do it, if we infiltrate, if we write a letter, if we pick up the phone, if we give donations, whichever way, standing on the forefront of whichever way take your heart takes, we must be strong now. We've got to stand up for Mother Earth. This is about us being together as people. And so when we have a government that's giving us this opportunity, and it's an opportunity of a lifetime, because like Lucy said before, if they had known back then when the referendum was how much impact this could have, they would have asked for more. And we're not asking for much. We're just asking for a voice. We're just asking to be heard through a governmental system that has kept us down. And so when we're here, this is our healing journey. And this healing journey starts with us and it starts with all of us. And so by healing and giving us a voice to be able to create opportunities within the governmental systems to be able to change legislations and laws on, on environmental impacts of our country, this is where it starts when we get together and we start uniting our voices. And, you know, um, having people here that are, are right here listening to us and listening to, um, you know, our pledges, people that really want a voice in this country, um, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for being here and I'd like to acknowledge everybody for doing their work uh, and the work that they're in um, where they're at. And on that note, <laughs> thank you, everybody, for listening to um, my little spiel and um the, so in saying that, so SOS actually brought me to ACF um, as First Nations lead. Uh, so I saw an opportunity and I took it. And so here I am. Um, and I'm so proud and honoured to be here speaking with everybody. Um, and right now we have some amazing, amazing people working for country, looking after country. Um, these are our... Um, Oh, look, I'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves, but I'll, I'll tell you their names first. These are our amazing Indigenous panellists, and we've got Tamika Sadler. We've got Jaron Murray-Jackson. We've got Tatum Moore, and we've got Leisha Minikin. So thank you, everybody, and here's our beautiful guests. Awesome. Good I was going to say good afternoon. Oh, my goodness. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Tamika Sadler and I'm a proud um, Aboriginal, Torres Strait and South Sea Island woman uh, with my Aboriginal connections here to Gubby Gubby country on the Sunshine Coast. Um, and yeah, thank you, Arnie Josie, for that beautiful handover and, you know, sharing a little bit about your journey and, you know, thank you to you mob that are on the panel and other mob that are out here on the call tonight, um, having these big yarns. You know, in the lead up to the upcoming referendum, um, you know, there's a lot of big conversations that are happening right now. And, you know, by having this here tonight is is a way for us to be able to, you know, create um, these conversations to our broader um, family and friends and, you know, our communities. So, yeah, um, one of the questions that came up um that a lot of, you know, people sort of submitted was asking around how the voice can increase the power of traditional owners to protect the environment and have an influence um, on the decisions that, that affect environment and climate. Um, and so to give you guys a bit of context around the work that I do, um, I'm a First Nations justice campaigner um, in GetUp. So, you know, we work um, an, on a variety of campaigns um, from fracking in the Northern Territory um, to cultural heritage protections to, you know, stopping deaths in custody um, and things like that. And, you know, I guess with the upcoming referendum and so much mis and disinformation that is out there, um, 
I just want to say, you know, our mob um, have been here thriving for over 60,000 years. Um, and that's a legacy in itself that all of Australia should really be proud of, um, of the oldest continuous culture. Um, and it's right here in our backyards. And, you know, we are so welcoming um, to, you know, everyone that is able to live and breathe and learn and visit this beautiful, you know, vast majority of nations. Um, and so, yeah, traditional owners and our mob have been leading, you know, the climate movement since climate change has been, you know, a topic of discussion for decades now. And, um, you know, the thing that really resonates with me um, discussing, you know, how mob are always talking about how when country is sick, we are sick. Um, you know, I say everybody has the access to clean water. That's our birthright. And First Nations communities are always first and worst impacted by climate change. But we are not the ones that are um, really putting in those emissions into, into our atmosphere, essentially. Um, and so, yeah, I've been working on the Don't Frack the NT campaign for almost nine years now. Um, since I left high school, I was a volunteer uh, with seed mob um, and a bunch of other climate organizations and um, you know my my background is in environmental science and you know through the last decade we've seen um, origin energy have um, fracking licenses in the uh, about 90 percent of the northern territory um, and you know it was the power of people and community to put that pressure on origin as a company um that you know traditional owners in the northern territory were able to um essentially stop origin origin energy from exploring those fracking licenses any further but in saying that um you know we've sort of got a new a new enemy in town um which is tamboran resources and they're a company based over in the US um, that has access to a mega fracker. So it's the biggest um, fracking machinery um, that we've seen. And it's currently um, already set up in the Beedaloo Basin. Um, and they've started, you know, exploring um, the different licenses that they have. So um, Origin Energy pretty much... Um, had too much pressure from, you know, the public and community um, for about a decade now. And so they ended up selling their fracking licenses to Tamboran Resources. Um, but it's the fight that, you know, our mob and traditional owners have been doing for years, um, in particular, a beautiful elder um, and auntie from the Garawar and Yanua tribes um, in the Beedaloo Basin, Aunty Maria Pyro. Um, this quote really stuck with me was that, you know, she said, the day that we, as in Aboriginal people, are born, we are born responsible for our country. Um, we're responsible for, you know, the land, the water, the plants, the animals and everything else in between. And, you know, that's why we are still here. We are still thriving. And, you know, that is our connection to um, the nations that we hold. And, you know, by having this referendum um, and an Indigenous voice to Parliament, um, you know, this is a way that we can influence the government and parliamentarians um, and policies about the issues and the solutions that impact and affect our communities. Um, you know, like we've said, fracking has been going on for decades um, in the Northern Territory and across all of Australia, and we have the largest machinery that is in our backyard right now. And we are two and a half weeks out from the referendum, you know, and it's really important that our mob are able to be able to have a seat at the table and to be able to talk about the solutions that we know we can implement in our communities to what we are facing currently. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, by having this voice um, 
enshrined in the constitution. You know, we are able to influence the laws and policies that work best for our mob and for our communities. And we're able to ensure that our culture is going to keep thriving for hopefully another 60,000 years to come. Um, and I just want to give you guys a little bit of context about me. I'm, I'm a mum. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of parents that are also on the call um, tonight. And, you know, I think the driving force for me is that I don't want my children to have to inherit this fight. I don't want my children to continually rally on the streets, um, scream down, you know, the megaphones and to have to go into, you know, painting banners and getting signatures and petitions. I want my children to thrive. I want my children to be able to go out into the community and to practice their culture safely and have access to clean water if they go out bush, you know. I want them to have access to the cultural heritage that our ancestors have left behind. And I want them to continue the practices because I know they are so proud, you know, they they are so proud every day to, you know, go and speak to their friends or just a random person like at the coffee shop, my son will say, hey, are you Aboriginal? Um, and it's, you know, very sweet, but, you know, he, he gets a lot of, you know, people saying, oh, no, I'm not. And then he goes, well, did you know that this is Gubby Gubby land and, you know, the next generation, not just of our mob, um, should be proud and, you know, celebrating our culture. It should be all of us celebrating our culture and all of us, you know, really taking that next step forward in the education um, around, you know, the broad issues. And um, yes, thank you, bless you. <laughs> the broad issues that impact all of us because, at the end of the day, climate change is not only going to impact First Nations communities, it's going to impact everybody. And if we don't act now and if we don't establish, you know, a yes vote um, in the upcoming referendum, a lot of the work that, you know, our mob um, and, you know, the climate movement have been fighting for for decades is really going to be pushed to the side and not taken seriously by the government. Um and, you know, I think that in saying that there's a lot of mis and disinformation um, around the referendum, but, you know, there's been so many great examples um, of how, you know, this body and this advisory body is able to successfully work in the government. Um, a great example, um, if if you guys haven't heard, is from the Sami people um, and they are Indigenous to Finland or Sami Digi. Um, correct, I, I apologise if that's, you know, not the correct pronunci pronunciation. Um, but they were really, you know, able to establish this advisory body in 1996. So 27 years ago, they were able to ensure that the Sami people were able to have, you know, a voice on the issues that impact them and to be able to put the solutions on the table for the government to hear and to establish into their policies. Um, and, you know, that advisory body consists of 25 people and they consult the government on a range of issues, you know, that we are hoping to establish here in Australia, you know, things on climate change, conservation management, mining licences, community, community planning, you know, implementation of traditional language um, and so much more. And that's all we're really asking for is, you know, for all of us to come together um, and unite as a nation and to heal and to celebrate the oldest surviving culture, you know, in the world. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, October 14th, there's there's been so much going on in the media but, you know, it starts here by having these, you know, meaningful conversations um, and to and to really lead with your heart um, during and into, you know, October 14th because 
you know, you are voting on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander livelihoods. And, you know, the conversation has been an emotional roller coaster for us mob. Um, but, you know, it's about time that we're able to finally have a seat at the table and to have, you know, all of our elders be able to advise and to give solutions um, that, you know, we know what works best in our communities and what works best in my community might not work best in somebody else's. And by having this body, um, you know, it's a way to establish a, a greater change for the next decade. And, you know, we're, we're calling on the Labor government for a greater change for all of us, not just for us right now, but for the you know, generations to come because the outcome of this vote is going to impact the next decade of work that we're all, you know, so passionate about and that we're all striving towards. Um, you know, you can't have climate justice without First Nations justice and it goes hand in hand. And so, yeah, I'm I'm very grateful that, you know, I'm able to have this conversation with you all tonight and um, to share you know, a little bit about myself and the work that I do. But I'll leave you guys with another beautiful quote from Ani Maria. Um, she's, again, a Yanua and Garawa woman um, from the Beedaloo Basin. And she said, you know, we have the solution to fix our problem. Just give us a chance to lead. And, yeah, I think it that sums it up perfectly, just give us a chance to lead because we already have the solutions in both climate justice and First Nations justice. It's so important that, you know, we are pledging to write yes, but also having, you know, the hard and meaningful conversations with our communities around why they should also be writing yes and really getting out there and encouraging, you know, the rest of Australia. So, um, yeah, I might pass it back to Lucy. Thanks so much, Tamika. And as you were speaking there, I was imagining, you know, that it's past October 14th, we've had the referendum and, you know, we've established this, you know, grassroots representative voice that's really working. And so I think what resonated for me in what you said is that children can be children. Um, and I think, you know, when you share your story of coming straight out of high school into climate activism and the burden that that is, you know, it is hard. And, and you know, so within this, there's this broader opportunity and that, yeah, that, you know, you have the solutions and this is a permanent place to be able to provide them where that voice doesn't have to always come from kids with banners. Um, so thank you so much for sharing, um, you know, and there's a lot of um, love coming for you in the chat. I'm going to pass over now to Jaren, our next speaker. Um, and I'll let you introduce yourself. Thanks, Jaron. Hello, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Wurundjeri country, Wurundjeri and Incom today, and acknowledge their elders past and present. Thank Jono, Isabel and Lucy for organising this event and giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, my name's Jaron Murray Jackson. I'm the reserve seat holder for Jar Jar Wurrung on the First People's Assembly of Victoria, which is the voice for Victorian First Nations people. Um, I also have strong connections to Yorta Yorta, Wamba Wamba, Barat Barat, Judawara, Waveru, Wagai and Wiradjuri. The last three years I was an assembly staffer working in engagement and then early this year I decided to throw my hat in the ring for the Jar Jar Run Reserve seat and yeah, I was lucky enough to be selected to represent them on the treaty table. We're fortunate in Victoria as treaty truth, voice treaty and truth have been well underway since 2016. Um, Ani Jill Gallagher, who was a treaty commissioner, uh, travelled around the state to see how we should go about treaty. Then in 2019, the First People's Assembly of Victoria had their election. 32 members were elected, 10 of which were reserved seats for traditional owner groups with formal recognition from the state, like Jar Jar Run. The rest were elected through general elections across five regions, Metro, Southwest, Northwest, Northeast and Southeast. Um, from 2019 to 2023, the first round of members had the task of creating the treaty foundations. They created the treaty negotiation framework, which is the ground rules for negotiations, the treaty authority, which is the independent umpire who oversees negotiations, and a self-determination fund, 
which is the fun to level the playing field for Trish owners when they start negotiating with the state. They also called on the state for a truth telling commission because everywhere we went, we heard from community, there can't be treaty without truth. We saw the creation of the Yuruk Justice Commission, the first truth telling commission in the country. The assembly had elections earlier in the year and we the members who have been elected will be negotiating the first treaty in this country. It's important to note that there'll be two types of treaties uh, in Victoria, so that there'll be truth learner treaties, um, because every mob's different. Gunai Kurnai's treaty down in Gippsland will be very different to Jar Jar Rung's treaty in central Victoria, uh, because our land's different and our people are different. Truth learner treaties will cover things such as land, water, language, culture and more. And then the other type of treaty is a statewide treaty, which is a transfer of power from the state, uh, from the Victorian government, over to us as the First Peoples Assembly, which will allow us to make laws policy, and policies for First Nations peoples on things that affect them in matters such as justice, health, education, housing and more. The Victorian government have realised that what they've been doing for Indigenous people the last 230 years isn't working. They know you get better outcomes for Indigenous people when you listen to Indigenous people, more so when you give control to Indigenous people which has enabled us to action all three elements of the Uluru Statement of the Heart, Voice, Treaty and Truth. Some other states have started similar processes, but Victoria is a few years down the road in our journey and we're already starting to see the benefits, which is one of the reasons why I'm voting yes. Having a national voice would be a start for more than other states. You don't have that voice and representation. When you create a strong black institution, focus on the same goal, you see real change and real self-determination. Sure, the voice is only an advisory body, but it's the first step in the right, direct, right direction. Um, I'll, I'll go through a little bit of what Jar Jar Rung gets up to now. So in two, 2013, the Jar Jar Rung Clans Aboriginal Corporation entered into a native title settlement with the state of Victoria. Our recognition and settlement agreement was an important milestone for Jar Jar Rung people and the Victorian government as they now recognise us as the traditional owners of this country and acknowledge the history of disbursement and dispossession that has affected our people. It also provides us with some legal rights to practice culture, access and use our land and resources, and to have a say in what happens on, on our country. The agreement gives Aboriginal title of some of our traditional lands, including the right to actively manage country. The agreement is an important starting point for the self-determination of Jar Jar Rung, and we will continue to build up the structures and processes that will enable us to make the most of these rights. Since then, we've created our Dalkin Yajar country plan with goals for strengthening Jara or Jar Jarung people, cultural practices and customs, cultural heritage, bush tucker and medicine, riverways, river, rivers and waterways, land, self-determination, traditional owner economy and joint management, which gave birth to, our, to strategies like our climate change strategy, renewable energy strategy and forest gardening strategy, which all ties back to caring for country and, in, and the environment. When traditional owners have control of country and how it's managed, you get a healthier environment every time. Even with all this great work, there are still lots of gaps for Jar Jarung people, which I hope will be filled by treaty negotiations sometime next year. Treaty negotiations which all stem from that first brave step to create a collective voice for all First Nations people in Victoria. You can see what a collective voice here in Victoria can do. It's time for a national one. Once we get a national voice established, I have no doubt we'll be able to close the gap, heal country and improve the lives of all people in this country. Because when you give us control over our own affairs, we thrive. And when we thrive, all of Australia thrives with us. Um, I'll go to the question that was pre-asked to me here. So the question was, what is in place or what can be done after the vote to ensure the voice is representative and benefits the country, the community on the ground? Um, so I guess, firstly, if you look at the design principles of the Indigenous Voice to Parliament, there are three pillars regarding this exact issue. The voice will be chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people based on the wishes of local communities. The voice will be representative of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, gender balanced and include youth. The voice will be empowering, community led, inclusive, respectful and culturally informed. So just by looking at that, you can tell that it, 
it will be representative and you know hopefully it will reach to the community on the ground um i believe the base model for the voice proposes two members from each state and a further five members would represent remote areas due to their unique needs um, an additional member would represent significant population of Torshad Islanders living on the mainland here. I think that takes it to about 20 or so. Um, all of those seats will need to be democratically elected by their communities. That's why it's very important that community in the right, voting in the right people for the voice. It's going to take a lot of hard work being a national soundboard for First Nations issues. Representation is something I'm really big on. We're currently working on how the Assembly represents all First Nations people in Victoria. We started at a point and have been building since 2019. And we're doing things like adding more seats for traditional owning groups, creation of an elders and youth voice and, and more. The point is we got ourselves in the door. It wasn't perfect and we acknowledged it. And now we're doing something about it. So hopefully the voice will do, will do the same. If there are any gaps with their representation or, or engagement. Um, in closing, it's important to note that the voice would have an organization to help them reach their communities. Just like the assembly does, we have an organization of around 50 staff supporting us elected members do our job with roughly 16 in engagement. This all goes back to my point of creating strong black institutions. By doing so, it gives us power and a space for leaders of our community to come together, which can only be a good thing. And yeah, that's all for me, thanks. Thanks so much, Jaron. Um, and I think it's been really valuable to hear some examples of like that this is happening, you know, this process has happened in its in different ways before. Um, and I think, you know, what you really sort of ended with there with, you know, describing that um, you know, on the on October 14th, we vote yes or no for the for the concept. But one of the good things about um, doing the hard work to get it right afterwards is we can continue to grow it and form it as we, you know, work through the challenges that will inevitably come. And I think that's a really important thing to share. And I'm really glad you've done that today. And um, it's been really, uh, I think the other thing you've highlighted is that the voice alone is not the solution to everything that we're working on. And there's so many other, you know, there's the treaty, there's the truth telling, and that, um, you know, all of us here on this call from um, the conservation groups and the First Nations community know that there's a lot of hard work that comes around this and that we're all committed to doing that hard work together. So thank you so much for sharing. And yeah, I'm really excited to move to our next speaker, um, Tatum, who is joining us. And yeah, Tatum, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself. Yuridu Marang, everyone. Hello, I'm joining you from Willow Wiradjuri country. My name is Tatum and I'm the CEO for the Dabiga uh, Local Aboriginal Land Council. Um, and like many of our brothers and sisters on here, we all wear <laughs> very many hats, um, especially, I guess, under the LAUC, um, you know, we, from, yeah, health, education, housing, um, juvenile justice, you name it, um, we're a part of it all and we try to do it all. Um, but also outside of that, um, you know, many committees that we've put together as the First Nations people um, of Willow Wiradjuri country, um, you know, we're a population of over 50,000. So there's over 19 nations that all uh, Willay Wiradjuri country home. Willay is the possum, which is the totem for the eight clans um, that are traditional owners um, or traditional custodians of this part of the Wiradjuri nation. Um, and even, you know, I was just thinking about recently with the possum being the main totem and we talk about impacts of, um, you know, climate change and um, you know, it's very it's very rare to see actually a possum in this part of Wiradjuri country, um, which I think is very sad because considering that 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 is a totem for the main clans here in Dubbo. Um, but yeah, I I saw the question there. I just thought I'd jump straight into it. But um, there was a question that came through, and it said, "How does the voice affect land sovereignty?" and for me, I think, you know, if we look at or well, even thinking about the word sovereignty, it has many different meanings. Um, but for me, sovereignty in that spirit, spiritual notion is, um, you know, our kinship connections as Aboriginal people um, that goes back 
to 65,000 years, um, no one can ever take that away from us um, because I think there is this belief to sort of around that if we are added to the constitution that we somehow mysteriously, that, that sovereignty vanishes, <laughs> that we that we lose that. And I think that, yeah, for me, that's completely false because no one can actually take away, that's like our birthright, you know, and I want to say to like our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters that are born here and call, you know, our country Australia home, you also have that kinship connection to our country. It may not stem back to over 65,000 as Aboriginal um, and Torres Strait Islander people's connection does, but you still have that, that kinship connection and that responsibility that comes with it. You know, as First Nations people, um, there's this saying that we're born into obligation um, because... I don't think it's ever anyone telling us that we have to do this. It's like that need, that that responsibility that we're born into, that we want to do something, um, no matter what it is, that we we want to be a part of it, we want to fight for the rights of our people and, and caring for country. Um, so, yeah, for me, that I just thought, yeah, I, hopefully I've answered that for some people, but I just think that, um, you know, for us, if we are, if the referendum is successful, in terms of how the voice will affect land sovereignty, I think if anything, it, it even empowers it because again, we're going to have a voice, um, which is somewhat giving us that little bit of power, right, to have a say on how we care for country and the policies and and the laws and the things and the decisions that have been made um, on our behalf for a very very long time and have we've never ever been included, but yet we suffer the consequences of those decisions that have been made on our behalf when it comes to devastation, um, you know, rainforest devastations or the mining and fracking and um, affecting our, our waterways. Um, there's stories from my, you know, my great grandmother, she talked about when she was a little girl and um, how the rivers were clear, you know, the water you could, they swam in it and you could drink straight from it. We're now, you know, out this way. So, um, in acknowledgement, I sorry I should have um, introduced my kinship connection. So um, out of respect for my mother and my father, so I am Wiradjuri and Yorta Yorta, as well as Barkindji, um, Gurnu Kunya, um, my father's side. So spread far and wide, <laughs> um, and you know we're seeing the impacts of um, what's happening in all those parts of the country. I remember John and I, when we had a yarn earlier, we were talking about the rivers, you know, um, out at Wilcannia and seeing the devastation. We saw the fish that, you know, rose um, up in, and it was like thousands of fish that were dead. And it was like it took that to sort of get, you know, the government's attention where our mob out that way have been screaming out um, and marching and, and fighting for the country for a really, really long time, um, where all of that could have been avoided hence if we our voices you know were somewhat being um, listened to so um, on the side of everything else again I'm a mum as well um, and I have little ones and I guess as sister girl was saying there earlier to Mika you know we don't want our young ones having to to fight this fight um, in the future I'm being told by my elders is you know even when I've asked them if they've wanted to speak or um, share their thoughts about, you know, especially considering things like the voice. And um, a lot of them have even said to me, it's like, you young fellas turn now, you know, it's like the baton's been passed on because they've been fighting this fight for a really long time. And now they say they are tired, you know, and they do, they do feel burnt out. They may not show it. They still get up, stand up and show up. <laughs> but um, they're actually now saying that, you know, we need you young ones that have got that fire in the belly to, to to continue that fight and, and be our, our voice and even looking at the I keep trying not to watch the questions but I did see someone say that it's very sad that um you know that Aboriginal people have to ask non-Indigenous people for this voice um if we had been given a voice say over 100 plus years ago um how different things may be right now um you know even when we think about women's rights and um well, the most recent one was, you know, being, um, our, you know, lesbian or gay marriages and just the fear that stemmed around all of those things. Um, and we know that the voice, I feel like, is that chance to really heal and, and unify our nation. But something powerful happens when our people are actually part of the conversation and they're a part of the decision-making tables. 
Um, and I think Brother Boy was a perfect example there, Darren, when he was saying some of the things that they're um, being able to achieve and what they're working towards down his ways, you know. So, um, and we're seeing that across the country. There's a lot of different communities that, um, you know, are working, I guess, you know, with their, their traditional custodians, their elders, the people from community, but um, even their local governments, like, that are listening, um, working together towards the the same outcome. And I feel like that's what The Voice is for us, is that chance to really have a say on the things that affect us um, and the way that things are rolled out or implemented. And I feel like moving forward, we, we truly can, um, you know, see a, a positive um, difference. So what's been happening obviously isn't working and it's a chance to try something like different and new and it is a little bit scary I think change is scary for anyone um <laughs> really you know no, nobody really likes change but this is a good change and I think that we shouldn't be afraid of it and I really want to encourage everyone to to support it and and really trust your heart and be critical of all all that misinformation dis disinformation that's out there because there is a lot of um fear and scaremongering that's happening um but yeah that's that's pretty much from <laughs> from me but I just wanted to, yeah, really share the importance that by having a voice, I think that as far as caring for country, we'll have so much of a difference moving forward. Um, if anything, you you won't need so many groups and stuff, you know, um, trying to look after and fight for the environment um, where we can continue to look after it, but be like nurturing it and not have to, to fight against mining or, um, you know, fracking and, and cutting down rainforests. Um, for my, for me personally, I also think that being able to have a say on legislations, I know just for out my way, you know, um, there's been things where certain scar trees have been cut down and we don't find out until years later because they're on a farmer's property. There's nothing that states that they have to get permission to cut that tree down because, you know, they own the land. <laughs> so, um, those are the types of things I feel that if we're able to have a say on, um, you know, different legislations and policies, that we will see those changes implemented. And that's all we're asking for is is a voice to be able to to have that say. You know, no veto. We don't get no special, um, no, nothing special or anything different. It's just having that say, being that advisory body. Um, no power, no veto. We don't control funding. Um, it's just simply that offering that advice and that they have to listen and there's somewhat that accountability there as well it's it's public um and if they don't hold up their end of the bargain then all of Australia knows about it and sees it so I think that's the best part of it and that's probably what scares the coalition or the coalition. <laughs> sorry but um that's what it is it comes back to that accountability and no one wants to be told how to do their job right so um I think that's where that fear and everything is being delivered because yeah at the end of the day they, they don't want to be held accountable um or told how to do their job so that's me <laughs> thanks everyone thanks so much Tatum and it's you know it's interesting to um hear healing coming up you know from when Tamika spoke to to when you just spoke then and 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 that you know that it is unfortunate that the process that we have where, you know, non-Indigenous Australia will define what happens in this moment. And this really is a moment for healing because our whole population can um, offer an opportunity for that voice to be permanent and to be there. And, you know, I think um, a lot of the people who are attending tonight uh, work really hard to keep the government accountable, right? That's what people here do. We keep the government accountable to looking after country. And so I think, you know, while the voice is advisory, um, there is that work that we know we can do to keep people accountable to like those public um you know, commitments and, you know, things that might come through the voice. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, I also heard a lot of nurturing, you know, like it's a healing moment, but maybe it's a, an opportunity for us to have to, we won't have to fight as much to stop impacts of the environment and we can nurture our relationships as people and the environment that comes alongside that. So thank you so much for sharing. And um, I'm going to throw over to Talisha now, who's our last speaker for the night to share some of the perspectives that um, she has. And I'm just waiting for her to come up here she is um so throwing over to you now Shalisha. 
Thanks, Lucy. Ngara, everybody. Nganyunga wheel, Talisha Minikon. Nganyunga Babun wheel, James Minikon. Kabi Kabi, Garang Garang Nations. Kema Kema Mary and Maluligo Nations, Zanat Kes. Uh, Amber Island, Papua New Guinea and Scotland. So, hey everyone, my name is Talisha Minikon. Uh, in Kabi Kabi language, I just shared with you all that I descend from the unceded sovereign nations of the Kabi Kabi and Gurangarang peoples, the Keme Keme Meriam and Maluligal nations from Zenat Kez, which is also known as the Torres Strait Islands. Um, I'm also Australian, South Island, Papua New Guinea and Scottish, so I have a really big mix um, in my bloodlines, like, like a lot of us. Um, so I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm zooming in from today, which is the lands of the Gimwe Wallabari, Yidinji and Yudikanji peoples, um, and just want to acknowledge my fellow pan panellists, Tamika, Tatum and Jaren, and also all of our allies in this room, our First Nations people in this room, our allies in this webinar room today, um, and just acknowledge all of you and the work that you're doing to constantly, you know, rewrite those narratives and constantly be thinking about you know caring for country in the way that we do um do this work so just a small bit about me so I'm the eldest of six siblings I'm one of 51st cousins so I've got a really big drive so like what um Jaden was saying you know we're born into that obligation we're born into responsibility um I raised my three children my three Walbai children here on give my Wallabari Yidin Junior at Kanji land so Georgie Junior is eight Blessing is seven and Zion is two years old we are a homeschooling family, so we've been homeschooling for about four years now, and I am the co one of the co-founders of the Girigarum First Nations Homeschool Co-op, which is, uh, from research, I think one of the first of its kind in this nation, also a co-founder of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Warrior Scholars Youth Advocacy Movement up here in Gimoy country. Um, I run a local black business up here called TT Pop. I'm a youth mentor and a volunteer for a local grassroots organization called Deadly Inspiring Youth Doing Good, also known as Didge. And I'm also one of the co-captains for the Cairns Yes 23 campaign. And so like what Tatum was saying again, wear a lot of hats and, you know, I guess do a lot of things in the community. But when you are born into this life, that's just what we got to do. Um, I just really want to say a big ethor to Lucy and Jono the CAFNET crew and the environmental movement um, for the opportunity to have these really deadly and imperative yarns this evening. So I'm going to share with you all a bit about my story and how I got to, I guess, where I, this conversation today, um, and it's going to tie into the question that I'm answering. And so the question that got asked um, for me to answer is why are some Indigenous people and groups opposing the referendum? And so before we get started, it's important for you to know that I was initially a no voter about 18 months ago, a very hard no voter. Um, I had a lot of run-ins with a lot of my family that were yes voters. Um, you know, as a sovereign First Nations woman who exercises my sovereignty daily through, like what I said, that self-directed learning and education, running my own business, um, you know, I really thought to myself, why would I want to legitimise the fact that this colony is built on stolen land? And so, quite frankly, for me, um, because of this country's history, I just I just couldn't bring myself to trusting the government, um, you know, and a lot of you know our history and know, um, you know, the dispossession and the disconnection and the discrimination that happened for First Nations people and as I was going back and forth in my mind and in my thoughts, I, I felt really heavy about it. Like I know a lot of First Nations people are feeling just from personal conversations that I've had and even just conversations that I've seen online and I was wrestling with it. And my grandfather is turning 80 in January and when I was yarning with him, he was saying, well, look here, bub. He said, we got we to gotta start with something, eh? He said, you know, he said, my mob, my my elders, and he's talking as an elder, and he's saying his elders, we've been working for this for a very long time. And, you know, we've been in this, in the trenches for, you know, First Nations justice for hundreds of years. And he said, but we just, we, it's very important for us to continue taking that st those steps forward. And so my grandfather was saying, you know, I, I'm going to vote yes. And I believe that it's something that we should have. We should have had a long time ago, but we should be working towards that now. And so that really started to shift, I guess, my heart posture. And then I was yarning with one, a couple of my aunties and, 
you know, they were just talking. One of the questions I said to them was, if we said yes, would it mean that we're giving up our sovereignty? Would we be going backwards? Um, would I be not grassroots enough? And so I kept wrestling. And, you know, for me, it wasn't good enough that if you don't know, vote no. That to me was, it was not an excuse. It wasn't good enough. Um, and so I started on this really deep dive into, you know, trying to understand what this country was going to be doing in October the 14th and, um, you know, Read or read Megan Davis's book and Thomas Mayo's book and listened to the TED talks about the Uluru statement from the heart. And then my auntie, Larissa Minikon, said something to me and she said, "You know, as mob, as black fellas, we have this tension when it comes to what's going on in this country." And she was talking about, you know, how we understand and we we know our history. And you know, just to give it context, my dad only went to grade five. Um, was not allowed to have any resources, wasn't given a pencil in his classroom, wasn't given paper. And so, you know, having those barriers, um, thank goodness that's not like that anymore. Um, but having those barriers in terms of the education system, and she was saying to me, you know, the voice, it's, it's, a, it's a continued step in the right direction, something that we've been fighting for. And she was talking about, you know, Look at where we've come from as black fellas since the 1967 referendum. You know, we've got black university graduates and First Nations homeowners and First Nations business owners. And then she re related it to myself as a First Nations woman who is, you know, writing our own First Nations curriculums for our young people now. So really leading in terms of educational sovereignty. And so, you know, I know that not a lot of, well, not everyone is able to do this, but the thing is, Sorry, it's my fans going crazy here. My voice is a bit dry. I know that not everyone is able to do some of the things that my family and I get to do, but the thing is we can't be what we can't see. And so, you know, when I think about, you know, when it comes to educational sovereignty, you know, we as First Nations people, it's important for us to be learning about, you know, the history of this country, but also learning about how to care for country and look after our country. And, and you know, that's one of the biggest things when it comes to First Nations education with my children. One of the core foundations of what we do is that caring for country concept. And it's something that I know when I went through 12 years of schooling in the colonial system that I wasn't afforded. There was not really anything in regards to educational sovereignty, anything in regards to looking after country, caring for country. And, you know, I grew up here in Cairns and so there's black fellas everywhere up here. Um, but going through a Western system and not really having that opportunity, when I graduated, I thought to myself, you know, later on as I had children, this is something that I can't afford. My children have to be connected to the country. They have to have that anchor so that no matter where they go in their lifetimes, they have that ability to understand where they come from and who they belong to. And so... After these conversations with my family members and about what the last rep referendum did for our mob, it really it really changed my heart posture. And so, you know, I know a lot of people are, are talking, or there's a lot of those hesitations because it's going to take away this, 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 I guess, questions about is it going to take away our sovereignty? Is it going to make me not grassroots enough? Is it going to do this and do that? But, you know, I guess for me, sharing tonight really is to share with you that there are mob out there mob that are edu that are exercising our sovereignty every single day through our educational sovereignty sovereignty through business sovereignty you know through um you know like what Jaron and them are doing down in Victoria and what Tatum and them are doing in Tamika and those that's exercising our sovereignty and so you know I share these thoughts with you because for me I believe that our country we're in a place where we've got that pen of purpose in our hands right now we have that ability right now to write what the story is going to be for this country. And we have the ability right now to be able to say, this is what First Nations people are wanting. And I know that there are people that are, you know, speaking and saying, you know, sovereign First Nations people don't want this. But I share with you as a sovereign First Nations woman that this is something that we do want. And, you know, people like your Jacinta Prices and your Warren Mundine, it's very important for the, the population that's listening to this narrative to remember that they don't speak for all First Nations people. And so it's important to remember that, you know, 
when you are listening to the different things that are going into the social media airwaves, that you're fact checking this that this information, and that you're going to reliable sources. Because the thing is, a lot of over eighty percent of First Nations people want the voice. Over eighty percent of First Nations people are wanting to see this change and wanting to, you know, really help to unify this nation. And so it's going to be a step forward for all people that call this place home and you know I really believe that every single one of us are extraordinary and every single one of us have that ability to really write history right now and so I believe you know with with the context of you know my background and the things that I'm doing up here in Gimway that when we're voting yes and if you're thinking about should I vote yes what should I do where am I at for me, I believe that when we're saying yes or when we're voting yes and writing yes on October the 14th, I believe what we're saying is we're saying yes to treaty. We're saying yes to truth-telling. We're saying yes to our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander voice. We're saying yes to caring for country. <laughs> we're saying yes to forgiveness but also yes to healing. I believe that we're saying yes to hard but very, very necessary conversations. We're saying yes to decolonising our lives together. We're saying yes to kindness and compassion and unity. I believe we're saying yes to humanity and I believe that we're saying yes to love. And as I wrap this yarn up and I guess just giving you a bit of context of how I went from a no vote to a yes vote, I want to really share with you a quote that one of my aunties shared with me and she shared this quote with me, this quote to me. She said, are you an ancestor worth descending from? I'll say that again. Are you an ancestor worth descending from? Because one day we are all going to be ancestors. And regardless of your history, whether you're, you know, non-Indigenous, you're Pacifica, wherever you come from, we have the ability right now to make a change in this country that is going to not just impact Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Yes, it's going to impact us, but it is going to be impacting generations to come. And as I leave you with this last quote that changed my life forever, and it's it's relating to caring for country, it's, it's this. It says, may we be people who plant seeds that grow trees in whose shade we may never sit under. May we be people who plant seeds which grow trees in whose shade we may never sit under. And I believe that we have that, that ability to do that. And so my call to action for those of you that are, you know, especially our allies, my call to action for you is from a First Nations woman that exercises her sovereignty every single day is for you to pick up that telephone, send a message to your friends, do an Instagram post, have those really important conversations with them on why you're voting yes or why you think maybe you will be voting yes now and why you think they should be voting yes. Because, you know, you can hear as First Nations panellists that a lot of our people are wanting you to vote yes. And that's why I'm voting yes. You know, this is about humanity. And I really want to encourage you, do something extraordinary. Do something extraordinary for you and for your children and for your children's children because there's going to be people that are going to be sitting under the shade of impact of your life when we're gone and we become ancestors, you know. And so I just, I'm just, i just so grateful for this, this webinar and so grateful for the panellists I got to speak today. But, you know, we, we want this. First Nations people want this. And we really believe that even though there are some of us, some of our mob that are opposing it, it's not all of us. There is a, a vast majority of us that want this change and want to make these, plant these seeds of impact because we know this is our legacy work and we know this is going to impact generations to come. So I hope that brought some encouragement to you all. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy and Jono again, and I'll hand it back to back over to whoever's going to yarn. Thanks so much, Talisha, and I always love hearing you speak because you raise up my heart. And I think something that you really highlighted there for, for me listening is that this is an opportunity to keep taking a step forward on a long history of, you know, activism and, um, you know, from First Nations people. And, like, I was imagining, you know, I remember growing up in high school and thinking, why don't I learn about all of the things that mum and dad are teaching me at home, like climate and environment stuff and, and you know, imagining that when, you know, First Nations people have a voice and are, you know, advising on issues that matter to you, like the education system, it has flow-on effects for everyone that are 
are really positive, you know, and I, and I was thinking, you know, um, about I got to grow up and go into a school where I learned Jabbergai language um, in my in my school and how much that influenced me as a young person and, and what that might mean for the future, you know, if there's that kind of voice helping helping our parliament and these systems change to be better. Um, and I really like the quotes that you share, you know, and, and that this isn't um this isn't the moment or the biggest moment. It's like a choice that we have to make on a long history and a long future to come. So thank you so much for sharing. And I'm gonna um invite our other co-host and MC Jono back on to um, take us into the Q&A and all of our other panellists as well who are going to help answer some of the questions that have come up as we've been talking. Right. It is uh, so inspiring to be here with you all. Um, we've had a heap of really, um, really insightful questions come in in advance as well as some great questions come in in the chat. I'm going to start with one uh, that came in in advance and... I don't know how I'm going to do this. I reckon whoever's the first on the hot buzzer to jump in and answer, um, please do. So we've been talking a lot tonight about land, but of course, sea country is also First Nations country and our oceans are so important to life on Earth. So one of the questions that came in was, does anybody know how much of the oceans around Australia has been handed back to First Nations? Um, and what's the sort of, how will the voice interact with protection of sea country bunch of inland people here but you know you might still have answers yeah I think you know in terms of sea country that's still something that's you know a lot of mob that are on the coastline are striving towards um and you know it is it isn't something that is spoken as often as you know land like land um land rights um but I think as well you know when we sort of talk about the context of country it's not just land that we're talking about we're talking about sea country but we're also talking about sky country you know the constellation in different parts of you know our nations hold a lot of our dreaming stories um you know from our ancestors and um, you know, creation stories of, you know, our nations as well. So I think that's something that's, you know, a conversation that is still is still happening. But I think, you know, in the broader context of climate change, that's something that a lot of our mobs are working towards because, you know, as we, we've seen, you know, sea levels are rising and it's not just in the Pacific, it is happening in the Torres Strait. Um, and then, you know, as well with light pollution, light pollution impacts, you know, turtles being able to safely come on shore to, you know, have their, lay their eggs. And then, you know, that also distracts the hatchlings um, from, you know, what has been ingrained into their species for thousands of years, you know. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a conversation that, you know, we need to speak more of, um, especially around sea country um, and also sky country too. Mm, thank you. Did anyone else have anything to offer on Josie? Yeah, I, I actually think also um, you're right, Tamika, that um, there, there are also a lot of groups, uh, I, I know in the Native Title over here in WA that there was, um, there is no water or sea country involved in any negotiations or anything, but um, it is now, you know, there are different groups coming up and, you know, looking up, you know, looking out for the ocean. Uh, there are different environmental groups as well that are um, getting together with First Nations people to look after sea country, especially whales um, and, you know, turtles or sea life. Uh, so, it's really important because the attack on our water and our sea, um, you know, our freshwater and our seawater is it's it's real and it's happening. So, um, yeah, there are there are there are things popping up all around Australia that are protecting sea country and people are getting together to do it. Good sign. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a, a bunch of questions come in in a, in a similar vein around really. Um, how does the voice, how how will a voice 
help First Nations people stand up against lobbyists from, you know, whether it's big mining or or big lobbying, uh, big logging, sorry. Um, I, I suppose, yeah, can you t- talk to how The Voice, you know, will will assist in the struggles that you have all talked about on your country? Yeah, I think, you know, just to go quickly, I don't want to take up, you know, time and I want um, you guys to be able to speak on, you know, your own um, experiences. But by having a voice, you know, we're able to hold the government accountable for the false promises that they share, especially during election time. Um, You know, we can see just recently in the last couple of years with, you know, cultural heritage protections, you know, it was Reconciliation Week when it made international news of Jukun Gorge being blown up by Rio Tinto. And then, you know, we had the inquiry into being able to establish stronger cultural heritage, you know, reforms and legislation. And, you know, if that moment didn't happen, then, you know, the government wouldn't have changed the policies that have been implemented generations ago that need to change because the structures don't work for our mobs and they clearly you know um getting away with destroying our history um whereas you know they have um other historical you know monuments and heritage pieces and museums but they didn't find you know a sacred landmark as as important as something, you know, that could be found in a museum. And, you know, I think, you know, just recently in the last couple of weeks as well, um, you know, the the government, um, the Labor, go- Labor government specifically, hasn't been uh, very strong-willed in, you know, keeping their promise on, you know, a federal cultural heritage reform. And, um, you know, we've seen just recently, um, I think it was around a week or two ago uh, where Rio Tinto has again, um, you know, damaged another sacred site um, over in WA. So, yeah. Um, I guess like my view on like the lobbyist sort of thing is it's like hopefully um, we get strong black powerful leaders elected to the voice and their voice would overpower those lobbyist voice. Um, you know, there'll be a structure there that, you know, these strong leaders will be appointed to and they'll be able to go into parliament and have yarns with people hopefully before lobbyists do. So, yeah, that'll be powerful in itself. Yeah, great point. Feel free to jump in, Talisha, Tatum, Josie. Um, I've also got more questions we can line up. Go No, go for it, Josie. I saw that come off mute. Uh, yeah, I was actually just going to say because, you know, that's it's all over here in... W A, you know that we all know it's getting exposed there. Um, you know this, this especially Rio Tinto, um, and I think also you know having the regional voices, that structure of the voice, um, you're getting the grassroots, and that's what everybody's been saying. The grassroots people don't want this. The grassroots people don't want this. Well, I'm a grassroots person as well, and I do want this. And you know when you ask the grassroots people, they want it. They actually want somebody to have a voice for them in parliament or somewhere that they can express what their voice what they want to say about their country and that's the bottom line and this is the, this is where our voices have been stopped our voices have been stopped by legislations they've been stopped by ticks of you know tick boxes you know slashes of the pen signatures signed away that's where our voices have been stopped and so this is basically uh, you know, something that we can actually stop them from actually going right. They have, they know exactly where they are. They have all the the technical everything on our country. They know exactly what's in our country and what what they're blowing up and what they're doing. And so there's no excuse for them to be actually doing it and then saying sorry afterwards. So the the time is now for us to stand up. And this is where we need this voice. We need to be infiltrating that government, and we need to be telling our story from where we are, not from where they are. And that's what the voice is going to do. This is what the voice is going to empower us to do. And that people don't realise that, you know, this is not about a yes or a no. This is about protection of country and people. 
And that's what the bottom line is. We get to that and it's our hearts and this is where we have to go to. We've got to go, you know, get our voices there. And, and I, unfortunately, in the past, you know, we have our, our old people have struggled. They've struggled those barriers, the language barriers, the reading and writing barriers, all of the barriers that have been put in front of them. Now we're strong and we've broken through every single barrier and we're ready to talk. We're ready to have a voice. And so this is our chance and this is our time. And those things like children and girls, they can't happen anymore. And with a voice, I am 100% that I, I'm, you know, I'm going to be one of the ones that's going to be there telling telling that grassroots person who's talking to us about what I want, what I want for the country and what I want for my family. And I hope everybody else does too because that's what it's going to do to us or for us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to take a, a slightly different question. Somebody talked about... Um, the importance, obviously, uh, the important role that elders play in First Nations culture and communities and decision making. And a question I think um, came up about well, how does, if you have a range of age groups represented in the voice, how does that happen whilst also respecting the special role and authority uh, of elders? Um, Jaron, I wonder if this is an issue that's come up uh, in the Victorian uh, voice First Nations Assembly. Yeah, um, when Arnie Jill was going around in 2016, the community was saying, you know, there needs to be a voice for elders somewhere in this First Peoples Assembly structure sort of thing. Um, and there wasn't one set up from the get-go, so we had to sort of hit the ground running. Um, and in 2019, we set up an interim elders voice, I think, or maybe it was 2020 actually. Um, so there was two co-chairs who were assembly members and it was their role as an interim elders voice to travel around and, you know, engage with all the elders across the state and see what that structure, how they wanted to shape and look and how they wanted it to interact with the assembly. Um, and so we had our recent elections and then we have new elders voice co-chairs and now they have all that all the data from the last two or three years of engaging with elders of how they want that sort of elders voice to be shaped. And so now we just sort of need to create it. Um, it's going to take a while to figure out, you know, how to exactly how exactly it's going to work with the, the actual chamber and everything. But we're hoping that'll be set up over the next six to 12 months. Um, it'll be sort of like a formal structure within the assembly and it'll give advice on things. And when we start negotiating, we'll ask it for the advice, advice as well. So, yes, exciting stuff. And we'll also do a youth voice, which would be sort of similar, but it won't be as as much of a formal structure. So, yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, great. Well, I just had a slight echo. I think we're just about out of time for questions. Did um, did anybody else want to just add to that last question or make any additional remarks before we make a wrap? I was just going to speak to that, like, um, just after Jaron was saying, and I think, you know, every community is different, but um, I think even with the structure of the voices, that if our people in our communities, if they're able to elect or choose that person, um, and when we talk about elders, I mean, I know there's some clans where, um, you know, there might be a sister girl and she's only 35 and she is the last, um, you know, living or uh, descendant because, you know, all their old people, they're too old and they've got a lot of health issues. We have to think, you know, our people, life expectancy, we're lucky to live past 55. Um, so we're seeing a lot of young people that are actually being asked by their elders to step up and be an elder. Um, and this could be in different forms from, you know, welcome to countries and, and whatnot. So, um, again, I think it'll look different, but it comes back to a community where they, if they can physically, like, choose the person um, to be that grassroots voice um, or, yeah, to be that representative for their community to speak on the needs and, and the wants and the concerns. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's my hope too. It has to... <laughs> It's, it's it's hard like I said especially for um Dubbo like I really like I said we've got eight clans that are traditional custodians but over 19 nations you know that call Dubbo home and we all have that strong connection um so it's just I can see the concern and the worry around that because they're like how can one Aboriginal person be the voice for everyone and we know you can't <laughs> 
Um, and even, you know, that's another thing that I think is on the line a lot too. They were so isn't there like 11, pe uh, 11 Aboriginal people um, in federal parliament, but we have to remember that they only represent, you know, their constituents who elected them. That's how they got there. Um, but also the parties and whoever they affiliate themselves with. And the higher they get, I think there's somewhat a disconnect, right, between the people on the ground and the higher that they go up, um, that there's just so much, yeah, that so much that gets lost and is un doesn't get heard <laughs> in between. So I feel like that voice, the voice is going to fill that gap. You know what I mean? It's going to be that, that connection that nothing gets lost and, and that we are being heard. And like I said, and it's all out there in the public, everyone hears and knows about it. So it's not going to be just swept under the rug anymore as it has been for, for generations. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just um, wanted to lastly to... add as well. Sorry, John. I just lastly, oh. in terms of like you know the comments, the, the question about the elders and that, I think it's important to remember that First Nations people are relational people. We're not transactional people, and so when it comes to you know elders and young people and everyone in between working together, um, it's I guess based on the foundations of relationship and working together to see an outcome that will better all of us as a, a community and a collective of people. Um, and I'll just say one more thing as well. Um, one of my aunties or in some of the narrative work that I, narrative therapy work that I've been doing, they said there's something that they talk about in terms of um, working towards a change. And they, they the quote is that we need to be people that walk into the future looking backwards and it's not saying that we want to negatively dwell on the past, but that the history and, and that, you know, the things that have happened in the past, it helps to shape and inform our future and better our futures. And so, you know, when we're listening to our elders and we're relating with our elders, it's helping us to be able to make decisions and, you know, really, I guess, help to better our people. And I think there's all there was also some questions in there about, you know, is the voice going to help uh, with with uh, wind country and sky country and all that kind of stuff. And I think that it's important for you to remember that this is all a work in progress. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. And where this is like a succession plan working for a legacy. And so different generations are going to have different responsibilities that they're going to be taking on when it comes to the voice. And so just keeping in mind that, you know, as we work, um, I guess, and take step by step, it'll all help you know, for, I guess, working towards unity and the betterment of First Nations people, but also all people that live in this country. Thanks so much, Talisha. And I might just jump in there because I think we've come to the end of the time we had for um, our Q&A. And, and thank you to everyone who put questions in because it's really important that they're heard. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers so much for joining us tonight, um, taking the time out of your busy lives and your family lives. And it's so great to see some family joining us too. Um, you know, it's it's your leadership and your openness to coming to moments like this that make us all stronger as people. And we're really happy that we could be here sitting together tonight. Um, you know, I think what we've heard tonight that, that there is diversity in First Nations community on the referendum and that mob from progressive no exists and, you know, as people should be respected. Um, but leaders from across the nation and across our movement and by majority are asking us to step forward together hand in hand um, to have a moment of healing on October 14th and to make that a moment of hope. Um, and tonight what we've highlighted is that there are opportunities that exist um, through the referendum for both people and country but like everything, things that matter take work and commitment from all of us. And so, you know, um, it's not just about showing up on October 14th and writing yes. It's also about sitting together after that day, like we have for many generations now, to, um, you know, to do the hard work to make sure that the voice works and to grow and learn from the experience of having that. Um, and I think, you know, while First Nations people will lead that growing and learning, it will take all of us, you know, as allies and, you know, people together supporting that to succeed. And so, you know, I think um, you've really, uh, um, everyone's answered some really awesome questions 
for us tonight and that we are seeing the broader climate and environment moving, supporting a yes approach because of these, you know, um, you know, these larger impacts that the referendum has. But it is yes to truth telling, it's yes to treaty, and it's yes to voice. It's not just yes, um, you know, to one thing here. It's a yes and so much more. Um, so I, I think, you know, we also had a, a call to action that comes here, which was like we would like everyone to really think deeply about how they're going to vote on the day and write yes for all of the reasons that we've heard tonight on October 14, but also to talk to your friends and family and, like, I hope that everyone right now can write down three people that they might be able to have conversations with. And it's not necessarily just about having, you know, having a conversation where you go in and like, I'm going to convince someone to vote yes. But what we're talking about is having really meaningful conversations about what this moment is for our hearts and for our healing as people and for the country that we call home, um, you know, whether and and for the ancestors that we want to be. <laughs> um yeah, and I think there's some links that will be posted in the chat, you know, that will help you to, um, you know, uh, link in with some of uh, those opportunities and we'll also be providing them in the email um, that we follow up with. And I'm just going to hand over to Jono to talk a little bit more about looking beyond the referendum and to wrap us up for tonight. Thank you. I won't take much more of your time, but um, there was one final question that came through um, in advance that we really wanted to answer, which was, how can people continue showing solidarity with First Nations beyond and outside the referendum? I think everyone here has given you lots of tips on that tonight. Stand with your local mob, join local campaigns. Um, you know, it's not just about voting yes in a couple of weeks' time. It's about the broader struggle. I'm going to pass on two great resources that I think will also be popped in the chat. Passing the message stick is a source of evidence-based communications advice led by First Nations people to build support for that bigger transformative change. There's a website, lots of great things you can uh, get in, you can learn about how to talk about this stuff in a way that empowers uh, First Nations people. And then another one uh, is Talk Black, again run by and first by by and for First Nations people. It's an online platform dedicated to reclaiming our shared history, to truth-telling and building people power. It's got podcasts, it's got videos to keep you informed and ways to take action. Again, we'll share the links. Great way to keep informed and keep active. Thanks so much, everyone. I'm saying goodbye now on behalf of everyone. I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung country. Wherever you are, you're on First Nations country. Respect that and go well tonight. Thanks, everyone.